It's me, the devil. I'm here to convince you to do sin. Come with me. Steal candy from babies and small businesses. Ah, working designs. I know I'd be discussing this company eventually. Quite possibly the most contentious English localizer in gaming history. Infamous for their, uh, let's call it loose approach to translating dialogue and nasty habit of arbitrarily cranking up the difficulty on nearly every game they localized, everyone has an opinion on working designs. In one camp, you have the small contingent of hardcore fans who will fight to their dying breath about the greatness of working designs. In the other, the folks who hated the company even back in the day and prefer to dub them wrecking designs. Then in a third camp way over here, you have the younger players like me who missed out on both the fandom and hate-dums and wind up taking a more moderate stance on working designs. What makes a man turn neutral? Lust for gold? Power? Or were you just born with a heart full of neutrality? While I personally see their attempts to improve and rebalance the games they translated as borderline disrespectful of the people who worked hard to make them, I can't help but find the goofy translations enjoyable in their own way. The humor can be very hit or miss, but in all of the working designs games that I've played, there's a clear effort put into things like translating the dialogue into coherent English that rarely feels stiff or unnatural. That may sound like being damned by faint praise, but they began in an era of gaming when lines like, Do not fight now. Fighting when missed will freeze you with breath. were commonplace. Not to mention that a good number of the games translated by Working Designs are ones I doubt would have ever gotten an official localization without them. Do you really think that anyone would have even considered releasing the Switch's Cosmic Fantasy collection in English had Working Designs not done Cosmic Fantasy 2? Half of you had never even heard of Cosmic Fantasy until this video! Hell, I'd never heard of Cosmic Fantasy until I started looking into who translated one of the best Saturn games I've played, Magic Knight Rayearth. Maybe I'm wrong in believing this, but I truly think that Working Designs opened the door for companies like Xseed and Nipponichi's American branch to provide us with more niche Japanese games than we know what to do with. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I would really appreciate it if Sega would kindly re-release Magic Knight Rayearth. I don't give a damn about what you've got a license from Clamp to get it done. You bastards made one of the best Zelda-likes of that whole generation, and it deserves better than to be stuck on the Saturn for all time. Nine hundred dollar dues! Oh, and I guess I'm also trying to say that, for all their flaws, Working Designs did serve an important role in gaming history and should be acknowledged for that. I'm not saying you need to like what they put out, but at least give a begrudging nod that games like Lunar probably wouldn't have even come out in the West until the PSP remake, if even that, without them. But this isn't a video about the history of Working Designs. Not that I would be opposed to doing a series about that very subject if there's any interest in that. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more. For now, though, it's time to talk about a game that I've been mentioning since my very first video on this channel. Say hello to Alundra. Hi, how are you? Alundra was released in April of 97 in Japan as a PlayStation exclusive, and then was swiftly followed the next year by releases in both North America and PAL territories. The latter of which, for some reason, opted to change the title to The Adventures of Alundra. I should also note that despite the fact that Cygnosis was the company responsible for the PAL release, the English version still appears to use the working design script and, presumably, the changes they made to gameplay. Today's game was developed by Matrix Software, a company founded by ex-employees of Climax and Telenet Japan. Though it's the former Climax staff side who were definitely the ones at the forefront here, as this was clearly intended to be a spiritual successor to the Mega Drive slash Genesis classic, Landstalker. From the blonde, sword-wielding protagonist to a mix of Zelda-esque dungeoneering, platforming, and devious puzzle design, it's got Landstalker DNA to spare. I am your father's, brother's, nephew's, cousin's former roommate. What's that make us? Absolutely nothing! Interestingly, putting aside the change from an isometric perspective to a top-down view, Alundra is much closer to a proper Landstalker follow-up than Climax's own attempt at a spiritual successor, Dark Savior. In fact, many of the top staff on Alundra worked on Landstalker. Alundra's director, Yasuhiro Ohori, worked as first unit map designer. Kenji Orimo headed up map design in both games. Same for character design in both, being handled by the late Yoshitaka Tamaki. And event programmer Masumi Takamoto is credited as the logic tool programmer on Landstalker. 
While several other staff are connected through Tamaki's Super Famicom strategy RPG, Theta, the Emblem of Justice. And despite what that title may make you think, it's actually closer to Shining Force than Fire Emblem. Which makes sense when you realize that Climax was one of the co-developers responsible for the original Shining Force. But I'm getting off topic. Alundra stars, well, Alundra, an elven adventurer capable of entering other people's dreams. Our hero is troubled by a recurring dream of a spirit calling him to the village of Inoa. Referring to Alundra as Releaser, the spirit pleads with him to save the villagers from the evil god Melzas, who is twisting their dreams into nightmares. Seeing as how we wouldn't have a story if he didn't, Alundra boards a ship and sets out for Inoa. It's just too bad for him that this is a post-Link's Awakening Zelda-like, so the ship isn't long for this world. Luckily for our pointy-eared buddy, he washes ashore not far from Anoa and is nursed back to health by the town's blacksmith, Jess. From here, Alundra will have to help the townsfolk in both the dreaming and waking worlds if Anoa is to stand a chance against Melzas. As I said before, many of the core gameplay elements you can find in Landstalker are present here in Alundra. However, the Zelda influence has crept its way in much further this time with a greater focus on items and sub-weapons, in addition to the perspective shift from Landstalker's isometric view to the three-quarter top-down angle preferred by many other Zelda-likes. In fact, with all the platforming you'll be doing in Alundra, it actually winds up resembling Beyond Oasis to a point. There's about as much warped perspective fuckery screwing you on jumps like in Beyond Oasis, that's for sure. I didn't think I'd say this after the havoc that Landstalker and Dark Savior wreaked on my depth perception, but I kinda wish they'd kept the isometric perspective. There are words to describe how stupid that is, but if I said them, I'd get bleeped. There were so many times in Alundra, especially later on, where it took a missed jump or two before I realized that a platform was higher than it first appeared. Making things all the more irritating is the downright cruel number of times that this game expects pixel-perfect jumps from you. I swear, if Alundra didn't control so damned well, the platforming would have been a deal-breaker for me. Alundra's attacks are swift and responsive, with sub-weapons like bombs and magic spells offering extra ways to get yourself out of sticky situations. There's also substantially more weapons in general compared to Landstalker. Not only does Alundra acquire improvements on his sword, but he'll eventually gain access to a flail, a bow, and elemental magic wands. However, the sword is by far your best option for the majority of your playthrough. The flail does equivalent damage and has better reach, but its slow attack speed can put you in a tough spot if you miss. Meanwhile, the bow does pitiful damage and is best saved for puzzle solving. And while the wands do get a few moments to shine, you know how there's a point in the game where you've figured out how you prefer playing and tend to stick with what was working before? Well, these wands didn't enter the picture until a few hours after I'd hit that point. But what really hampers combat here is Working Design's attempt at balance. This was a particularly nasty habit they had when localizing games. Typically, Working Designs would crank up the difficulty to unfair levels by simply changing a few values to give more health to enemies and make them deal more damage, which tended to make the games about as balanced as a dizzy hippo with an inner ear infection. With Alundra, though, they supposedly attempted to genuinely improve the balance. According to the Translation Notes section of the manual, quote, Monster difficulties were also rebalanced, generally to make a few of the bosses easier to kill. However, bosses were also made more dangerous in that if they managed to hit Alundra, their blows were much more lethal. This lessened some of the boredom of the later fights, where they really weren't much of a challenge to fight, but took forever to kill. Sounds reasonable enough, right? Well, according to the data mining I found on the cutting room floor page for Alundra, this was total bullshit. Instead, nearly every enemy in the game was given more health and made to hit harder. I haven't played the Japanese version, but I've played enough Zelda likes in my life that I think I have a good feel for how many hits enemies should be able to take, and yeah. Those late game bosses in particular have the exact problem that those translation notes claim to have fixed. I can't show a whole lot for spoiler reasons, but holy shit! A couple of these fights took long enough that I was beginning to question if I was actually dealing damage. I'm pointing out the obvious here, but that's never something a player should be feeling when they're playing correctly. While I'll stand by my defense of their translation work being an important landmark in gaming history, changes like this make it feel closer to a lazy ROM hack than a professional release. As far as I'm aware, there was never any coordination with the original developers in regards to any rebalancing that Working Designs did. To me, it reeks of arrogance, or at best, incompetence. 
They were a publisher and localizer, not a development studio. And yet the company did this so much that a good portion of the games that Working Designs published have an unworked hack available, including Alundra. Though I should note that the page lists it as untested, and because I didn't use it for my video, I can't vouch for it. But I'll leave the link in the description in case any brave soul out there wants to be the one to test it. Fortunately for us cowards, these changes aren't enough to make Alundra obnoxiously difficult. Trust me, if I can beat a game without too many deaths, it's not that hard. The most it winds up doing is making some fights feel like they take too long. Which I suppose could still be a bit of a problem for some because, fuck me, this game is way longer than I expected. I was expecting something closer to Landstalker's 10 to 15 hours to beat, not double that. It should be noted that Alundra isn't an unnecessarily lengthy game, or it didn't feel that way to me. I was just caught off guard by how much larger this game is. The map is positively packed from corner to corner with side paths to upgrades and extra items only accessible after you've obtained whatever you need to clear the way. Add to that plenty of devious puzzles scattered across its double-stuffed dungeons, and you've got a game which rewards exploration while keeping your brain hard at work. The main issue I have with the larger scale of Alundra is the back asswards way you access the map. In spite of using so few of the PS1's buttons that Working Designs had the room to bizarrely make L2 and R2 open the menu in addition to the start button, Alundra requires you to speak to the old fortune teller and give her 15 gold every time you want to look at the map. I assume this was less of a problem on release, seeing as how the game came with a fold-out map, but those of us who got our copies in digital PS1 Classics form were out of luck. Access to a map is most sorely missed in the longer dungeons. Obviously I was able to make do without one, there wouldn't be a video otherwise, but that doesn't mean I didn't run around in circles like an idiot several times before I figured out where I had to go next. With how much more influence Alundra took from Zelda compared to Landstalker, you'd think that they would have included dungeon maps at least, considering it's a feature that's been present in every Zelda game since the original and all that. Back to the positives, Alundra's visual style has aged wonderfully, fitting the darker tone of the story they wanted to tell. Matrix opted for a darker, mildly washed-out color palette without stooping to the real-is-brown mentality that would steadily come to grip the industry in the coming years. Just enough to provide a somber mood while allowing some colors to pop here and there. The character design work by Yoshitaka Tamaki is similarly excellent. His trademark exaggerated style with their Mickey Mouse feet could have easily wound up feeling out of place in a far more serious and dour work, Yet I think that this contrast is what makes it click. I don't know what the psychological term for it is, but there's a familiarity to Tamaki's style that instantly calls back childhood memories of classic cartoons and anime. It felt like I knew these characters at first glance and could easily empathize with them because of it. Well, okay, Alundra is basically just Nigel with a rat tail, but the others don't have as clear of an analog from other games that Tamaki worked on. On the audio front, it's much more of a mixed bag, while the music is great, having been done by longtime Soccer Awards composer Kohei Tanaka, many enemy noises sound more compressed than you'd expect from a CD game. What's weird is that there are plenty of other sound effects that don't have this compression issue at all and sound just fine. Overall, it winds up being a very confusing auditory experience. And at long last, we come to Alundra's story. Honestly, this might be one of the most underrated stories among any PS1 game I've ever played. You go in expecting the usual save the day plot, and instead you get hit with a morose tale that touches on topics such as depression, abuse, religion, and death. Lots of death. Now normally, I don't have too much of an issue with how working designs would add in comedic dialogue or pop culture references as generally, they usually localized more light-hearted fare. Here though, man does it feel out of place and downright inappropriate at times. For example, it's funny at first that Bonaire here talks like a California surfer dude because he doesn't seem all that important to the plot. So when Bonaire turns out to have an actual role in the story and a subplot focusing on him, the fact that he talks like Bill and Ted ruins the mood every time. 69, dudes! From here on out, I'll be talking spoilers. 
If you haven't already played it, I seriously recommend experiencing Alundra's story for yourself blind. So I won't begrudge you skipping ahead to my final thoughts here. But if you're intent on staying, here we go. For as much as Alundra tries to play the hero, he struggles again and again to prevent villagers from dying. Even the aid of young Sybil with her prophetic dreams proves to be of little help in preventing Melzos from wreaking havoc on Inoa. It isn't long before many villagers, in their despair, begin to suspect Alundra himself of being the cause of their misfortune. Their religious leader Ronin and his right-hand Giles take advantage of the situation to cast Alundra as a scapegoat for all of Inoa's woes. This is all complicated even further by the arrival of Maya, another elf with the same dreamwalking powers as our hero. Maya's cynical, blunt nature causes many villagers to view her as the more competent dreamwalker, even as she insists that villagers trapped in their nightmares are beyond help. Eventually, Alundra's supporters are whittled down to Jess, the blacksmith who took him in, Sybil, and Inoa's resident scholar, Septimus. Nothing can stop Alundra from his quest to save the people, though no matter how much they may come to hate him. And it's right when things seem to be turning a corner in his quest, as he begins to finally save villagers from their nightmares, that Sybil is murdered. Not in her dreams like the others, but her neck snapped like a twig in the middle of town. Wait. Who's that walking off over there? Oh. Oh, Ronan's gonna die. Slowly and painfully. So desperately convinced in his zealotry that the gods are punishing Inoa for trusting in the demon Alundra, a supposed man of the cloth has resorted to murdering innocent children. It isn't long before Jess goes to confront Ronan himself and winds up dead too. Here is a point I'll give to working designs in being able to restrain themselves enough to give Jess's death and the fallout from it the dignity it deserves. Ronan having the gall to lay the blame for Jess's death on Alundra at the man's funeral is a damn near perfect demonstration of Ronin's true, despicable nature. Making matters worse is the concurrent revelation that the patron deity of Inoa, whom the villagers venerate in defiance of the king's prohibition on idolatry, is none other than Melzas himself. All this time, they've been inadvertently empowering their tormentor. But how do you convince an entire community that the god they've offered countless prayers to is, in fact, a malicious entity who enjoys their suffering? With no easy answer to that question, Alundra has no choice but to continue with his work as he mourns the loss of innocent life. It's Alundra's determination to save everyone he can despite the hatred he endures that steadily begins to sway the villagers back towards him. Even the initially hostile Maya begins to soften up, possibly even developing feelings for him. Tragically, this is when Melza steps up his attacks first attempting to corrupt Giles into a demon through his nightmares by twisting his mistrust of Alundra into murderous hatred. The evil god nearly succeeds too as he almost kills his own sister in a blind fury, only staying his hand at the last moment and fighting off the corruption with the final shred of humanity he has left in him. The strain is too much for Giles' body to handle though, and he disintegrates before our very eyes. The downward spiral continues when the Murg, a race of simian-like monsters under Melzas' control, abduct one of the children. Though Alundra's attempt to save the child is successful, using the dreams of the boy's twin brother to reach him has disastrous consequences. Early on in the game, Alundra has to pray to the gods in the chapel before you can continue. Unbeknownst to Alundra at the time, this brief moment enabled Melzas to have a direct link to our hero's mind and allowed him to always be ready for Alundra's attempts at heroism. It also means that Melzas was able to order his Murg minions through the Dream Portal in a surprise attack on Inoa while Alundra was occupied. By the time our hero is able to make it back, half the village has been burnt to the ground and only a mere handful of its citizens remain among the living. This proves to be the final straw for the villagers, who are now ready to throw their support behind Alundra fully, even if it means opposing their own god. All except for Ronin, of course. Not that I or Alundra particularly mind, it's about time that Jess and Sybil were avenged. Even with the power granted to him by his Dark Lord, Ronan is no match for Alundra, the vile priest going to his grave still convinced of his own righteousness. I can't help but notice a strong underlying critique of organized religion here, especially once you learn that Melzas isn't truly a god in the traditional sense, 
but a demon given godlike status by mankind out of desperation for something to worship after the wars of the old gods ravaged the world. The curse of nightmares befouling Anoa came about because Melzos was being worshipped less than in the past. Out of desperation to retain his power, he trapped them in nightmares in the hopes of driving the villagers to return to their prayers. But the climax is built on the villagers placing their faith in a man, or elf in this case, rather than any god and rejecting gods altogether, is very Nietzschean. To me, the primary message of Alundra is one about the dangers of blind faith and the corruption inherent in granting absolute social and political power to religious leaders. So much death could have been averted had Ronan simply swallowed his damn pride and accepted Alundra's presence in his village. But Ronan had grown so accustomed to being Anoa's voice of moral authority that he felt his position threatened when an outsider came along offering solutions that didn't require blind obedience to Ronan. At the end of it all, though, Ronan dies alone and abandoned by the flock he sought to control. For added irony, it is through the power of faith that Inoa overcomes its darkest hour. However, it's faith in their own power over their dreams and Alundra, rather than faith in any distant god. While one could see it as them simply replacing one savior with another, I see it more as the villagers' faith in themselves and will to change for the better as the true power that enables Alundra to destroy Melzas once and for all. It's why he's repeatedly called Releaser. Not Deliverer, not Savior, Releaser. He's releasing the people of Enoa from Melzas and the line of dead gods before him. From there, it's up to the villagers themselves to chart a new course. In essence, they have become their own gods. I got all that from a Zelda-like. You see why I want people to play this for themselves? Alundra is a downright excellent game worth anyone's time. While it has its annoyances and a translation with a nasty habit of sabotaging the drama of certain scenes, these are nowhere near enough to ruin the experience. A fantastic evolution of Landstalker's gameplay, coupled with a story that possesses far greater depth than you'd ever expect from this genre, make for what has become one of my favorite PS1 games. Unfortunately, as of the writing of this video, Alundra is no longer easily available digitally, and physical copies can run over a hundred dollars. With any luck, it'll reappear on PSN someday. Despite Alundra's commercial and critical success, Matrix Software never seemed to be able to recapture the same magic. Alundra 2 has so little to do with the original that virtually every praise for it that I've come across appears to boil down to, it's a good game if you don't go into Alundra 2 expecting a proper follow-up to Alundra, and after Dual Hearts on the PS2, Matrix slipped into a hell of spin-offs the actual developers didn't want to do themselves, licensed games, and the occasional co-production. Though that does appear to be changing for them, as Matrix has managed a few original titles as of late, managing not only three games in their Omega Labyrinth series, but an unexpected sequel to the cult PS1 strategy game Brigandine. Okay, so a dungeon crawler series with a breast expansion gimmick and a sequel to an obscure PS1 game isn't much, but it's a step in the right direction. 